All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us th today. Uh, I'm Lisa Worley. I'm the chair of the Small Museum Special Interest Group for MCN. And with us today is John Turner from the University of Michigan Museum of Art. And he's going to talk about how they installed, customized, and used collective access at their institution. Um, if you have access to the chat box, you can send us questions that way and I'll field them to John. If you don't have access to that, you can send me an email at l-w-o-r-l-e-y at fordhouse.org, and I'll check my emails and get questions to John. Um, without further ado, John. Hi, welcome. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, we're going to talk a little bit today uh, about our experience using collective access uh, at the University of Michigan Museum of Art. Um, we before before we get into this, I just wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we're going to break this session up into a couple of different um, different moments here. Uh, I'm going to go through a brief introduction of who I am, uh, and then I'm going to talk a bit about the history of how we used it and got to where we are now. And then for that, it should only take about half the time. I'm trying to save the last half for a demonstration along with questions and answers. Um, but as Lisa mentioned earlier, feel free to ask questions to her along the way and she'll interrupt me when it's appropriate. Um, and then we'll do a brief pause where you can uh, ask questions either through the chat um, or through the conference if you're in. Um, and then we'll proceed with the demonstration. Um, and that will really be guided by feedback we're receiving from you during the uh, presentation. So let's get going. All right, so who is this guy? Um, I have uh, long experience with the museum world. Back in high school, my senior year, I worked at the local historical park there, which was the Celery Flats in Portage, Michigan, where I was Farmer John most of the time, but occasionally I was Mr. Crispy, uh, and I had quite a bit of hair. Uh, after college, I found my way out to the West Coast and found myself working at the Exploratorium, uh, doing a lot of technology work there, specifically on uh, doing research for handheld and mobile device technology prior to uh, smartphones being released into the market. And I did a little bit of web development there before I left. Uh, my wife and I took some time off, traveled around the world, and we ended up at uh, Ann Arbor where I started working at the University of Michigan Museum of Art. Um, did a lot of initially work on their dams infrastructure, keyword project management, and then everything else you might expect uh, someone who's sort of heading up the technology area of a small museum uh, would work on. And for the purposes of this discussion, we're going to talk a lot about collective uh, collections management, specifically collective access. So a little bit about the University of Michigan Museum of Art. Um, we're quite old. We've been around for over 150 years. Um, it's an encyclopedic teaching collection with over 20,000 objects. We have 100,000 square feet plus of gallery space, and that includes five uh, temporary exhibition spaces where throughout a given year, we will do 12 to 15 uh, temporary exhibitions. We have about 240,000 people coming through our door every year. It's a little bit skewed because a lot of that is student uh, numbers. We do have some classrooms in the building um, where we also have two open storage and study case galleries and two close object study rooms where we do a lot of education. Last year, we engaged over 7,000 students, um, which is pretty great, and we had almost about 5,000 uh, K-12 students also coming into the museum. Our staff is pretty small, uh, it's 35 staff, but we have a lot of temp workers and a lot of volunteers and docents. So collective access, how did we get here? Um, way back in 2010, uh, I finally was able to put enough pressure on management with the help of the registrar at the time to get them to understand that we needed to change. Um, and some of those needs were pushed about because we needed better access to data. Um, people have, at that time, really wanted to be able to have that data hook up to other uh, experiences for the visitor, whether it was on the website or in gallery experiences. And with Embark, which was the system we were in prior to Collective Access, that was very difficult. It always involved intermediate steps. Um, that, that system also relied on an outdated model of a client-server uh, path, which was really shocking to the senses when you think about where we are in a web-centric world that, that we would still be existing in a client-server model. But so many of the collections management systems do just that, even to this day. 
Um, we were also frustrated by the fact that, that the Embark team seemed to provide infrequent uh, release cycles for updates. And what came out in those updates wasn't that exciting, and it didn't really help us very much. So there was a lack of innovation there. We also wanted something that would provide better workflow integration options, which again, which is very similar to better access to data, we couldn't really do easily with, with uh, Embark. And again, I mentioned earlier, there was a lack of innovation or motivation by the vendor to make change. Uh, and it, it had difficult to use reporting features um, from a customization standpoint. You could, you could do what you needed it to do, but usually you needed assistance from the vendor uh, in order to make that happen. And of course, there were steep, steep ongoing licensing fees, both from the, the infrastructure side as well as from the licensing side, just how many users you would be uh, able to access that system at once. So we decided um, that we should do some research, and we had discussions with peer institutions around the country and uh, in some instances in other countries. Um, and it was a really good mix of other university museums, similar in size and scope and mission uh, to what we have. But we also included other mid-sized museums and then other museums using open source technologies. Uh, and we interviewed them and asked them a bunch of questions. Um, they were very, very open, which is great. That's one thing I love about this community. But we asked them what they were using and how long they were using it, what they liked and what they didn't like, how many users they have for both accessing and reading the information, but also for editing that information. And if they could, what, what would their ideal product look like uh, from the very beginning if they could start over again, uh, having all of the experience that they had now? Uh, what features would they want in it? Um, and we got some really interesting information back. But what that did was that provided us the ability to inform management that um, we should begin really doing a comprehensive analysis of a, of a set group of products that was out there. And these were the products that we decided, decided to do a deep dive on and do a feature, uh, feature set analysis and comparison, as well as a cost benefit comparison. Um, you'll notice that some of these are industry standards. Some of these are very uh, edge case, some of them don't exist anymore. Uh, this was again back in 2010-11 when we did this deep dive. And we had issues uh, securing funding initially. So we kept returning to this list to see what these, what these technologies and what these products were offering as they evolved over time. Um, as you might expect, some of the open source options were actually progressing uh, at, a, at a pretty good clip while some of the industry standard um, options really weren't innovating very much at all. Um, what we decided to do was then narrow that field down uh, from that list of 14 to something that was more manageable. Uh, and we really focused on products that had open access to data, uh, the ease with which you can export data or migrate out of that system into something else. We were trying to think forward. Um, whether it was a client server versus a web native product, uh, any platform requirements, migration costs, licensing considerations. What we came up with was this list. So we, we contacted all of these vendors. We had wonderful meetings with them. Um, and we talked with uh, both with with clients they suggested we talk to, but then also clients we knew used these products that we didn't get from the vendors so that we could get a really good understanding of what, what might be true and what might be uh, puffery. And then what we decided on was we would take a gamble and we decided to go with collective access. Um, it was a risk, but management uh, is committed to openness at this museum, uh, not necessarily open source, but openness. And in this instance, we decided that where the product was wasn't exactly what we needed it to do, but we, we, we felt confident we could put a little bit of money into it and make it work for us. So that was where it gets really interesting. So now we have to fast forward to 2013, and the museum at that time decided it was in their best interest, even though we couldn't secure outside funding, to go ahead and fund this product internally. And we put out an RFP, uh, to Whirligig, it was a sole source because they were really the only folks in the United States. Um, there are others in Belgium and in New Zealand who are doing it, but they were the ones that would most serve us um, in moving forward. And that RFP came back lower than all of the estimated migration costs and development costs 
um, than any of the other competitors, including Gallery Systems, um, Mimsy, Mobius. It was it was quite shocking that it was well under even with the improvements we needed. Um, so that was outstanding news. However, by the time we actually got the go ahead, the money was secured, got all the contracts signed. We had some issues moving forward. Right after kickoff, the registrar left about six weeks in, and then right after that, uh, the collections assistant left, and then we had a four-month delay while we hired and replaced folks. The assistant registrar left right after we hired the new registrar, and then the senior curator retired. Um, it was a very frustrating experience, um, leaving me the only person with continuity on the entire project from beginning to end. Um, but after these delays, we were able to get our new registrar on board. And it was, it was fun because she wasn't necessarily someone who was wholeheartedly on board with our shift. It took some convincing, um, and we'll get to that a little bit later. But it was great to have someone who was challenging us in this experience along the way, which gets us to configuration. How does this process work? So first to understand, we, we assembled a project team that included the, the folks from curatorial, folks from tech, and folks from exhibition. Um, and what, what Collective Access is really based on is you define an installation profile. And the theory being that you can find someone's profile from an institution similar to yours and stand on the shoulders of giants and, and not have to make very many changes to your installation profile to make that work. However, where we started um, was way down at this giant's feet because there wasn't an installation profile that was comprehensive enough to support the needs of an accredited museum. And so we really had to start at ground zero and we worked in partnership with um, the developers at Whirly Gig to do that. This wasn't a situation where we decided we were gonna do the configuration on our own. Um, but through the work that we've done, we've already had other museums uh, take our installation profile because we do share it and they've been able to just go and run with it immediately. So really, maybe we were the, the ant in this scenario, but maybe we could be the giant for some other people uh, trying to help them move along the way. So in this process, we, we took an agile approach, which if you're not familiar with, is, involves a lot of uh, testing, uh, developing, uh, and then, you know, finding out what worked and didn't work, and then you have to redesign, and then you develop, and you test. And so it's sort of a, the cyclical approach that worked really well. We were on one-week sprints, and we had to prioritize what was important to us. Uh, the information coming out of these sprints really required us to, to take decisive action and quickly. And the majority of the time, we made really good decisions, and sometimes we, we may have screwed up and needed to fix that after the fact. And there were times when we disagreed, and that wasn't just us disagreeing with the vendor, it was us disagreeing with ourselves. Different points of view coming out of registration versus technology versus curatorial. And we had to work out those disagreements, and, and it was really great to have an, an outside party to help moderate some of these discussions. And we focused on defining uh, our processes and really spending a lot of time testing for our edge cases so that we could make sure this product was gonna work for us. But we figured our edge cases were many other institutions' edge cases, so we would be doing some work for them as well. And then, of course, you figure out what's missing. Um, throughout this process, you can't begin a configuration and, and do a waterfall approach where you just define all of your your uh, configuration settings initially and then know that it will work at the end. Um, through this iterative process um, of going back uh, again and again through these agile development cycles, we were really able to find out what was missing and create a wish list for future uh, development, either within the project, because we did have some money set aside, or for future funding efforts. And from discovering what was missing, we could take some of that money that we had set aside and identify some features that we want to develop. This is not a comprehensive list. Um, this was just a selection uh, of some features that we either knew before we began the project that we needed to have developed um, or we discovered along the way. Uh, one of the ones that's listed on here, uh, uh, well, it may not even be listed on here, was uh, we knew that it needed better reporting. And again, when we first looked at this product, it was in 2010, early 2011, and reporting in here was really bad. 
And actually, by the time we had the RFP signed, someone else had already paid for improved reporting, and that was something we didn't need to do. So we could divert those funds and help support some of these other feature improvements that we think are really going to help the field. Um, and then that gets us to migration. Uh, what did that look like for us? OK, so just to summarize, we had 21,000 actual object records, 11,000 object elements, and about 40,000 images, which in Embark yielded a, a huge number of records, uh, well over a half million, and about 18 million individual data points. And what we discovered through this process um, was that we weren't just migrating, uh, because as you bring in and you test, it's that agile approach again, and you're going to find out that maybe some of the configuration settings that you made weren't correct. And so we came up with, with this interesting point, and this is not a locker combination. Um, this is an interesting ratio. So 85% of our records took about 10% of the effort in our migration stage. And 14% uh, took about half the time and effort. And then 1% of our records took about 40% of the effort, um, which, if you think about it, shouldn't really be a surprise. Um, if you are like most institutions, you, you cannot possibly hope to have perfect data in the system that you have. And in this process of bringing data into a new system, you're going to discover pretty quickly where your, where your bad data is. And you can either clean that data up or you can programmatically account for it. And so we chose a balance between the two, but that's really where a significant amount of our effort took place. And so we brought in about 15 to 20 sample imports uh, for the probably month five through month 12. And that gave us some really good information. And then at the very last push when we were about Eight to, eight to nine weeks out, we did five full imports um, just within that last six weeks. Um, so this gives you some sense of, of what, what testing looked like in a real world scenario for us to bring this over. And then of course, how, how was it accepted by staff? Well, we knew that we needed to, to be engaging with our staff early and we needed to, to be as open as possible with them. And we were constantly reinforcing that this was going to be a total shift in, in how they use this product. Um, there was some, uh, some concern about how complicated it might be. And we, we tried to reassure them that if they could purchase airplane tickets on the web, they should be able to use this product without too many issues. So that did help a little bit. We also encouraged them to, to check themselves against how we've always done things because this product really allows us to do things in some new ways that we hadn't been able to do before. Um, and we provided enhanced support during the rollout. Um, and that consisted of one-on-one -on -one support for those who needed it, uh, weekly drop-in group sessions, and formal uh, training sessions that they were required to attend. Um, and so the weekly drop-in sessions lasted about nine weeks or 10 weeks during a period of stabilization. And they were actually quite well attended. And then what we found was kind of interesting. They were very empowered by the distributed data management model that we enacted, um, as opposed to how restricted things had been in Embark. Um, we also doubled the number of active accounts that we had compared to Embark. And they, they were very easy, eager to share what they had learned about how they used the system with their peers, even outside of those trainings that we had. Um, there was lots of discussion happening there. And, and most of them quickly recognized uh, what, what this could bring to the institution as far as innovation and how we might shift the way we work. Now, some people, of course, were not used to uh, doing things a bit differently. Um, and we wanted to reassure them that they were uh, still going to be able to read. Now, what I mean by that is um, when we made the shift from, from no electricity to electricity, uh, that, that put a lot of people out of work, um, but it also put new people to work. Um, but people were still, at the end of the day, able to read. It just wasn't by you know, whale oil lamp light. It was by electric light. Um, and so as soon as they, they came to the realization that they're still going to be able to do their work, um, they were reassured quite a bit. We also spent quite a bit of time, again, preparing them to, to have their world kind of turned upside down a little bit for a few weeks. Um, and we tried to equip, equip them with the right and accurate information. We were very upfront with them about the process. We did not release on time. We were about uh, six weeks beyond when we wanted to release. And part of that was because of the holiday. It happened right around uh, you know, the turn of the year. 
Um, and we also empowered them to contribute their thoughts and ideas. And this was especially important when we were in the testing phase. They were, they were coming up with some really good ideas about how that information could be displayed and used in ways that maybe we hadn't thought about. And they began to get it, but they began to get it at different rates. Um, some of them had their aha moment immediately. All you had to do was just describe it to them and they would understand uh, perhaps how one workflow would be shifted into a new way. But for some, they had to use the system before they could actually understand and, and really have confidence that it was going to work. And some of the, the people who were on the tail end of that really needed a full working cycle, whether it was you know, an entire accessioning process or exhibition life cycle or imaging or, or other processes that existed. They needed to see how their data working in this system would take them all the way through before they had a, a full level of confidence in it. And one of the surprises for us was that we needed to be careful what we were wishing for. Um, they were very much interested in having us push this tool much earlier than we thought they would. Uh, they were asking for new features. They were asking for entirely new workflows that we just weren't anticipating. But as soon as they saw the potential uh, for what Collective Access was going to allow us to do, they were pressing us pretty hard. And we actually had to push back a little bit. Um, people. People, as soon as it's on the web, have sort of a, a base understanding that you can do all sorts of things on the web that you might not be able to do in a client-server model. And the fact is that it just takes time to do those things. We can do them, and we're prepared to do them, but it just takes a little bit of time. So managing those expectations was, was not something we were necessarily prepared for. So what did we learn through this process? Keep it open and transparent as much as possible. We, when we initially engaged with Whirly Gig, um, we had them out so they could meet our staff and understand what we needed, but we really didn't do a deep dive into all of the tools, features, and functionalities and constraints. And so as a result, I think we lost a little bit of time uh, in that agile process. Uh, going over and doing things twice, sometimes three times, when if we had had a firm understanding of what the choices we were making, how those choices would impact the system as we were configuring it, we probably would have done it differently from the beginning, which leads to ask the stupid questions. I, I had assumed they would have done something like that, and they would have assumed that I would be more specific. So let's make sure that both, both sides are asking the stupid questions. And then develop a migration process based on the right field keys. Again, without having asked the stupid question of, well, we gave you access to Embark, we're assuming you guys took a, a real hard look at how it was structured. We ended up exporting the information in ways that wasn't as efficient and accurate as it should have been. And for a museum that went about five months after us um, uh, in the center of Michigan, they knew uh, up in Grand Rapids that we were making this migration and they used our profile. And we were able to help them because they were coming from Embark as well. You do it the right way. So now they are equipped to do it correctly from Embark. But for other systems, you really need to make sure they're, they're working on it correctly. And then creating test records with, with field values that match the field names would have saved us an immense amount of time from the beginning. We started doing this about a third of the way through, but we really should have been doing it from the beginning. And it's a process. Um, not all the people who are going to be involved in this uh, are going to understand the agile mindset, and you really need to prepare them for that. And then tracking tools. So as you're, as you're evaluating this and testing this, you need, really need to make sure that the tool you're using for evaluation is one that everyone feels comfortable with. And if it isn't, we need to switch the tool. And, and we weren't getting proper feedback or accurate, timely feedback from someone who didn't understand the tool that we were using initially. And about, again, the third of the way through, we recognized that and switched tools. And then manage the expectations of all the impacted staff and partners. Uh, it goes both ways. Really try to help uh, your integrator, if you have one, understand what your needs are and, and where your edge cases are so they can have a better understanding of scope. And, and make sure that your staff who are going to be involved in the, in the migration process and configuration process, as well as the end users, really understand what's happening. So at this point, I don't know if we have any questions, Lisa. Um, if we do, we can field some of those. If not, we can get into a demonstration of collective access itself. Um, we haven't had any questions come through yet. Uh, I just want to repeat my email address, address if anyone wants to send questions. It's 
L W O R L E Y at FordHouse.org. Um, but I actually have a couple of questions. Okay, fire away. <laughs> um, so why open source? Was it just that it provided all of those those points that you needed? Um, did it make you nervous to go open source versus one of the other already established databases? Um, it, we weren't pushing open source. We wanted open data and mm -hmm. open access to the data. Um, so really what it was about was looking at what, what sort of corners were we painting ourselves into when we, if we were going to pick a certain product. So we really, we really looked at what it would look like a year or five years from uh, post-migration in any of those four products that we listed. Um, with the uh, firms that we had available uh, to choose from at the time, after we really had a chance to, to look at how difficult it was to, to make adjustments later, uh, if your data model changed or if you wanted to shift workflows, and looking at what sort of support would be required, uh, we really were impressed with collective access. Collective collection space actually was easier to use but it didn't have the widespread, widespread use and support model that Collective Access did. So for us, it was, it, wasn't, it was never an issue of money from the beginning, although that was a motivating factor. It was really about what's going to offer us, the, offer us the most flexibility over time. And that's kind of how we decided to land on Collective Access. OK. Um my other question is, um, I have mentioned to you that I've used collective access at a small museum that I worked at. Um, did you find that after this initial development was done with WhirlyGig that you internally go in and make customizations now? Oh, yes, all the time. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, there, there are instances nearly every week where we're tweaking and making modifications. I am not always sharing back our profile as, as often as I should. So if anybody is interested in our profile, like just let me know and we will send it to you. Um, we were living in a world where it was difficult to share it because uh, we were functionally living in version 1.7, which was only released about three weeks ago. But we had been in it for about a year. Uh, so we would have to release the, the new code for them and then our uh, profile as well for it to work. Um, I must say that one of my favorite things about collective access is just someone who's not technologically advanced. Um, I found it extremely easy to figure out how to customize, and I loved that. <laughs> yeah, no, it is, it is really <laughs> nice. Um, but it is one of those be careful what you wish for scenarios. Um, I, we're lucky at our institution because we have someone like me here. Um, I am not in the collections department. I am the senior manager of museum technology, so I focus on all technology needs here. And uh, some of those, some of those needs can be complicated. So actually, some of the modifications that we do aren't just through the interface. On rare instances, we actually do modify the code, but more often than, than not, the the actions that I'm taking that our regular staff wouldn't be able to is is in developing those custom reports. Um, you can do a lot through the interface, but you have complete control when you when you do it uh, and, and write a custom report in PHP. Um, and we're able to do a lot of things there that we were never able to do in Embark. Um, and it's it's worked out really well for us. Cool. Those were my questions. Okay. All right. Well, let's <laughs> get going here. Let me shift this just a moment. And we can begin talking about collective access. And Lisa, I don't know if you, as a surrogate, sort of to represent the group out there. If you see anything as we go through this that you want a little bit more information on or you want me to stop and back up, just let me know. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll log in. Um, and again, we do have some challenging content in our collection, and this is live. Um, these are not slides. So if for any reason some artworks come up, uh, I know that our community should understand that, but I do want to throw that caveat out there. Um, so the way that it's structured, um, is we have a data model where uh, everything begins with a lot. So this would be the acquisition process, whether it is a gift, a purchase. So you would create a lot. And for that, we'll just go ahead and find some lots that are in there. And from a lot, you can create object records. Um, 
you put in all the detail about how this object is coming into your, uh, into your institution, um, whether or not there's just one object or multiple objects doesn't matter at this point. Um, but this is just the information about how it came into being. We have obviously the title, where it came from, uh, what type of lot is it? Um, some internal notes for how we integrate into the rest of the university. When did it get here? Uh, what type uh, of legal agreement do we have? Um, and then we have some, some workflow checklists here, uh, as well as what is the credit line when it comes in. And then there's additional attachments. So uh, our registrar is uh, about, let's see, we're about 15 months into using collective access. And she is feeling comfortable enough at this point to begin um, thinking about whether or not she is going to even have physical copies of some of this paperwork um, moving forward. Um, I told her to take another year and think about it, uh, but we could be getting to a point very soon where not only are we going to tactically work through the backlog of paper that we have to get it into the system, which this record doesn't have, but moving forward right now, all of the new documentation is being put in collective access and a hard copy is being kept. But that model may shift depending upon uh, her level of confidence in it. Um, then these are the objects that are actually in this lot. Um, and you can always add new uh, records here. Whether or not it's a lightweight object or an object or an object element, those are all constructs that we have created. Um, uh, for us, an object is an actual object that would you know, go on display. An object element might be its shipping container, its base, its crate, its vitrine. And lightweight objects for us are objects that we care an awful lot about, but maybe not as much as our objects. So these are objects that are coming in as uh, perhaps a, a an exhibition loan, an object that's coming in for conservation because we have an Asian uh, conservation lab. So we, we wanted to break out what types of objects that we have. Um, and then we can go ahead and go into an object record. So let's go into a really well fleshed out one. So we have uh, the ability to have as many fields as you would like. Um, we're an academic institution, so there's a lot of interest and a lot of uh, fine grain detail. So you may be looking at, at what we have here and, and, and say to yourself, wow, this is way more than what we would want to do. Um, but that's one of the reasons why we have so many fields. Um, this is sort of a collapsed view uh, on what everything might look like um, in this system, everything is edited live. Some systems that are on the web, you actually have to click to edit. Um, but here, as you, as you can see, everything is, is the edit field. Um, if you collapse these, then it's read only, but you don't have to go to another form to make the edits. Um, I'm going to just collapse everything again so that you can kind of see what's going on. There are different field types. So we have controlled vocabularies for us. Um, some of those are our classification object type pairs. Um, others actually are, uh, we're using controlled vocabularies from the Getty. Mm -hmm. um, so we're using the TGN as well as the AT. Um, and this was an area where collective access was um, supporting these, but the, the level of support and how it worked wasn't really working as well as we wanted it to work. Um, and so we put some money into improving those features. So now instead of just seeing the keyword that you've picked, you can quickly expand it and see what the full path is and actually have a link to that uh, record on the Getty's page. We also knew that if we were going to be adding a new keyword, uh, because there are so many replicative keywords in the Getty, if you type in something like clay, there's a lot of different choices and you don't necessarily see where it resides in the hierarchy. So this was a, an area where we had to come up with a workflow. So for uh, the people who are modifying these records, the workflow is actually that they go ahead and go directly to the Getty and they, they perform their search there. And this is the same for uh, either the TGN or the AT. And they find that the exact term that they look for uh, and then from that, they pick the ID. And then we have them paste the ID in. And from there, they're going to get exactly what they want, and there's no concerns. So 
Is that a little burdensome on the staff? Yes. Does it reduce the amount of integration that has to take place between the system? Yes. Um, so it, we found that it was a happy balance. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this. And again, uh, in modifying uh, these different data types, whether it's a lot or an object or an occurrence, which we call exhibitions, you can create different screens. And screens are sort of collections of fields. Um, and we have one that's just basic overview. And then we have different screens for different purposes or themes. And you can actually uh, structure these in such a way so they can be tied to, to roles and groups um, in the access control system. So if you are not a member of a particular group, and that group uh, that you are a member of doesn't have particular access rights, you may not even see certain screens. And likewise, the fields uh, may not be visible at all, or you may have read-only access to it. So that, that's kind of what you would expect, how it would work, and it actually works that way, which is great. Um, let's talk a little bit about locations. So for us, we wanted to be able to make sure that we could update our locations very easily um, in a way that was intuitive. So we worked hard to improve the um, data tracking on how these you know, location moves would work. When we first received the system, you couldn't define who did the move and when the move happened, even though those fields existed. The system was just assuming that the person who was entering the data was doing it at the time of the move. And that was a shift for the people uh, at WhirlyGig because you know, in, the, in the institutions that they'd worked with until then, that was really the model and how it worked. But we're so large and we're moving around so many objects for teaching purposes that it's oftentimes where those moves happen and then we catch up later. And we wanna make sure that we can put in accurate information. So there were just countless uh, improvements like that that we were able to put into this system that I think really make it a system that's easier for people to use. Um, you may be looking at this and saying, why is this object location history include exhibitions? Um, for us, that's what we wanted. We wanted it to do that. Um, we're beginning to think that we don't want it that way anymore. And, and if we want to switch it, it's great. It's not gonna, we're not going to break our data model. Well. We just change a few settings, and then it'll just be storage locations in one list. And then we may have an exhibition screen over here that shows that history somewhere else. Uh, but for us, for when we initially moved, that was important for us. Mm -hmm. um, and then let's talk a little bit about, oh, skipped one. Sorry, I actually want to go here. When we did the migration, we wanted to make sure that we were capturing field values in Embark that we didn't have a place for in collective access because they perhaps were no longer institutionally important to us anymore, or we were moving that data to a field that was far more powerful than what was available into Embark. And so we came up with a list of fields that we wanted to make sure that we could have accessible to our users um, at the time of import so that it was all captured. And again, this is a terrible example because you know, this record doesn't have a lot of this data uh, that was not structured the way we wanted it to, but when we had records with bad data or incomplete data or data that wasn't parsed correctly, we wanted to make sure we had a place where all of our staffers and researchers could go and look at what it was like as a snapshot in time. And likewise, there's a really wonderful way that you can configure a screen to, to show you what all of the different relationships with the different uh, data elements that you have in your system are. So whether it's entities as makers or donors or what loans it's been a part of, exhibitions, you know, condition events, that's something that we're working on right now. We're changing the way our condition events work. Um, what sets they exist in, and we'll talk about sets in a little while. So on this one screen, we can have all of this information, and we can quickly get to any of these records without having to do a search. Um, likewise, you're able to manage and put in object images as you need. They call them representations. We'll just go ahead and we'll edit this one so that you can see what fields we chose to have in here. Um, you can choose to give the individual uh, images titles if you'd like. Um, we export our, export our data to a couple of different systems visible by the public. Um, so we have some boxes there as to whether or not we want them not included or included. And then as we were 
implementing this system, we really were thinking about how when we do photography in the future, we may want to include information about the photographer that we aren't now, or where is the original media for this, if it's a slide, um, or is it native digitally? So we put quite a bit of information in there. And you're able to put in as many as you like, um, which is great. And then you can interact with those images um, in a pretty nice way. Um, these are not our highest resolutions images for this uh, example. There's annotation support, which we're not currently using, but we're very interested in. Um, and you can see that there. So let's just get out of here real quick. And then one last thing I wanted to talk about here. I mentioned workflows earlier. Um, Prior to when we wanted to do research on a day, uh, on objects in, in a bulk effort, thousands of objects at once, we had a pretty robust paper system in place um, for approval and review, and it was challenging. And so through this system, we were able to quickly create a set of fields. Some of them are actual fields uh, that are on the object records that we're just bringing in. And others are different uh, fields that we wanted to be able to use for tracking purposes. So now our researchers can say whether or not their research is complete. And based on that, we can create a report so that the curators can know which objects they are ready to review. And they can use these fields to communicate notes back and forth to one another or propose what the new data should be. And this has been outstanding. And we're, we're using this model actually now to sort of shift how we want to do this long term. This was for a specific IMLS effort. Um, and, and we're really happy with where that's gonna end up. It's gonna, not that you need to know right now, but it's gonna end up being a condition event um, called a data update effort. And you can see that here. So it's gonna have the similar type of functionality. So we're very excited about that. Um, this is a bit of a misnomer. I just wanna show you what this is. This says reports. This, you know, uh, oftentimes when you think about reporting in collections management systems, you think of reporting on multiple objects at once. This is really just a different way that you can display information um, about a particular object uh, through a display that's been defined within the system. Um, and you can define as many as, as you want. You can decide that it's only for you, or you can share it with a group or the whole uh, user base. So this has been great. Uh, we've been able to really reduce the number of specialized uh, requests that come in because staff are able to just make these displays on their own by going to manage my displays and really making what they need. Um, it's been really helpful uh, that, that, that the users have been empowered to have that kind of control over how they're using their information. When information leaves the museum, we're always making sure that they're using standardized formats and reports. But for their internal workings among their colleagues or even with themselves, they can choose the to display the information in ways that makes the most amount of sense for them. Um, so likewise, let's go quickly into, do you have any questions at this point, Lisa, that you think other people might have? Uh, I've had a couple come in. Okay. So. Um, Don is wondering what sort of effort is required to install um, what, like what operating systems, servers, specifications, that sort of thing. So uh, I'm not going to be able to rattle that off on the top of my head, um, <laughs> but it is based on the LAMP stack. So Linux, Apache, uh, MySQL, PHP. Okay. Um, uh, we have a dedicated server um, that we host monthly uh, through a company called Liquid Web. It used to be Wired Tree in Chicago. Um, we have a significant amount of storage on that server. Um, I could send you specific technical details after the fact if you want to get in touch with me. But the Collective Access website has a great uh, set of um, resources in there, including the technical specifications. Um, we went over those because we have so many images and we knew that we were going to have quite a few people using this at one time. But it, it does work really well. Um, I've installed it. Uh, half a dozen times um, on my local machine and two or three times on an actual server. Um, it's not that bad. Um, if you if you have some technical exp expertise, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, where we really knew that we needed to stop was when we got what came out of the box and the available installation profiles when we downloaded it from Git, 
initially, it just couldn't do what we needed it to do. Mm -hmm. And we knew that the, the amount of changes that were going to be required were going to need um, assistance from the developer uh, to do that. So I hope that answers that question. Um, another question is from Nancy, and she says, is Collective Access a relational database? Uh, yes. OK. Yes, it's not flat file. OK. And then um, Don has another question. Regarding workflow, can it send email notifications when action or attention is required? It's a great question that you have. That is one of the, uh, that is one of the nice to haves that came out of our process. We really wanted to add notifications. But there were other other features that we needed more than that. So that's on an ongoing sort of wish list that we have for future development. And we made that clear uh, clearly known to the developers as well. And they keep their own separate list. Um, they have been outstanding partners. Um, oftentimes, uh, feature requests that we have wanted, they have known they've needed. And either because we were you know throwing a bunch of money at it initially, they're like, well, we just might as well do it now anyway. Oftentimes, um, as was the case with reporting, uh, the reporting was just horribly tragic when we first looked at this product. But as other people saw the need for it, they, they have either taken it upon themselves to improve it and contribute that code back, or they've provided resources to WhirlyGig to have that uh, feature developed. And then it's the community. Um, I've received a lot of really, really complimentary feedback on, on the, the features that we've committed to this project. People are very glad uh, that we've improved it the way that we have. And we're, we're looking forward to other people improving it. Um, and if anyone would love to, to sort of chat about what, what I would like to see happen next, that you know, I'd be happy to do that at some point. Those are the questions that came in, so continue. OK, <laughs> all right. So let's talk a little bit about some other, uh, other things that we can do in here. Let's speak quickly about loans and exhibitions. So let's see here. Sorry, just trying to remember which one this is. <laughs> trying to go to one that actually had some, some good meat in it. So again, you'll see that the format is very straightforward. Um, you're going to have uh, information in this upper left area where it's sort of like a little quick info box. And then you'll have your links to your screens and then your field bundles over here that are on each screen. So again, we have a pretty robust exhibition workflow. Uh, we have a lot of fields in here. We're not just doing exhibitions that originate from us. We're borrowing exhibitions. We're buying exhibitions. We're putting together exhibitions where there's a lot of loans. Um, so we have quite a bit of information, uh, lots of different fields uh, for different departments. Um, and then we have information about our communications. What are these going to look like on the outside? How are our cred credit lines looking? What sort of deadlines do we have? Um, and there's all sorts of different deadlines that we've put in there, and these are repeatable. Um, it's, it's been really helpful for us. But then you're also able to see which objects are actually in this show. Um, and you know these are all. You, you can change the way these look um, based on, on on what your needs are. And for us, this was this was the way that we wanted it to look. Um, so don't don't necessarily see something and go, oh, well, that's the only way you can do it. But you can immediately then then get back to these object records that are in here, um, which is in, incredible uh, that it's all so so easily tied together. Um, and and again, it's. If you can buy airplane tickets, you can use this system. It's, it's pretty <laughs> straightforward. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do uh, moving forward is actually putting in uh, installation shots of our exhibitions now, which we have lots of. We just hadn't structured Embark in a way that would allow us to do it the way that we needed to. So moving forward, we're doing that now, which is really great. Um, again, looking at loans. So let's see here. So again, same model. Um, who's the borrower? Where's it going? Um, do, was there special handling required? You know, all of these fields were fields we decided were important. 
um, for an institution of our size doing this type of work. And again, you can see what sort of objects exist in here, um, what it, you know, whether or not it's connected to uh, an exhibition. Um, we decided not to do in relationships, but just in the basic info field. Um, and then we can talk a little bit about searching. So there's a quick search, which you've seen me use a few times. It's going to kind of remember things that you've been to recently. Um, Wildcard characters, the asterisks. Then there's also sort of a more advanced search. Um, so let's go ahead and do an object. So this is a, a quick search here, but now it's limiting it only to objects. And then there's an advanced search which you can define a bunch of different displays or forms for your search. So depending upon your workflow, you may expose different fields. Mm -hmm. The last outstanding feature improvement that hasn't been released yet is an actual advanced search. This was something that we didn't feel went far enough, mm -hmm. um, especially when you wanted to cross data models in the system. So we uh, actually have put some money into creating an advanced search tool that we're working with WhirlyGig right now that will allow you to do things like say, I want to look at this table and I want to find out how many objects we have who are related to this artist that were made between these period of, you know, this period of time that were in these exhibitions and you can do it all at once or you know, de detailed and complicated valuation searches. So that's something that's coming, um, but we're not there yet. But yet we are 15 months in and we've still been able to do everything we need to do, which is you know, kind of a testament to how this thing is set up. So maybe we're just weird, I don't know, but we, we wanted something that would allow us to, to search a little bit more closely than that. You can also define what are called browsing facets in your configuration. So if you know you're going to be browsing by particular things, uh, so like we could do, for instance, decades, this might take a little while because we have stuff that's incredibly old in our system. And as you can see, there's, you know, tons and tons and tons of decades in here. But it's it's great, you know, because then instead of doing a search for the 1990s, you know, whatever, whatever floats your boat, you can configure it however it works for your institution. Um, but this, this worked for us in our instance. Um, so that's kind of some other stuff. I wanted to talk a little bit about administration. Um, so again, access control is what you would expect. You can define users. You can define roles, which is who has access to what. Um, so let's just look quickly at what that looks like. And again, I'm going to be candid. This, this interface isn't exactly what I would want it to be. Um, I would want to be able to copy a role and then uncheck a couple of things and then save it out. But the way this works is when you create a new role, you actually, it's added, you have to add everything in that you want. It's kind of frustrating. But that, again, wasn't as important as some of the other features we wanted in this system. So at a high level, you can decide whether or not you want people to be able to do certain things within each of the different data model areas. And then once you've decided that, you can actually go down to the field level within each of these areas and decide which role has access to what. And then likewise, you can create groups. And we chose to have our users be assigned to groups, and then the groups are assigned to roles. And this was an intermediary process. This actually took a couple of different tries for us to figure out how we wanted to do access rights management. And we worked with the developers to come up with this model that we think works really, really well. And so far, it's been flexible enough that uh, we've been able to use it effectively. Uh, and then I want to just talk briefly about how do we manage stuff. So again, each of these user interfaces or screens that um, uh, user interfaces for the different data models. So say we're gonna we're gonna edit our object uh, system. So we've already defined our fields, but now what we can do is we can look at these different screens, and then we can decide what fields we want on that screen. Mm -hmm. um, so all of the fields that are on the object data model are available to us and we can bring them over. We can actually do relationships um, to a certain extent as well, which is really great. And you can define what the access rights are for that screen. Um, likewise, at the top level, you could define access rights for that particular data model. So that's really great. Um, and then if we look at how do we define what these fields look like, Let's go ahead and find loan note. So you give it a name, you give it an ID. You, you have quite a bit of control 
Um, you know, do you want it to use rich text or not? Um, what should it be bound to? So if I'm going to make a field that's repurposable, is it only repurpose repurposable within the object data model for just objects and object elements, but not lightweight objects? You have those choices that you can make here. Um, you can define your relationships. So if we want to talk about, uh, you know, if, let's see here, if we can find a good one. Sorry, forgive me. <laughs> so relationships between um, uh, entities. So were they employed by, were they educated at? You have this level of granular control over all of your control vocabularies and lists. Um, this is also the area where you would do your export of an installation profile. Um, and there's so much to talk about here. We can only really scratch the surface today. But one feature that I did want to uh, bring to your attention is that we wanted to be able to um, connect to ULAN as well. And so likewise with the other um, Getty uh, vocabularies, you, you use their tool to search for the, the person you'd like to bring in, mm -hmm. you paste it in, and then you can actually merge a record that you have with that record coming in, or you can create a new entity right from here. And it will bring in and write to all the specific fields that are Getty uh, and overwrite those values in your system. And then you have other fields that you can make at will to, to further contextualize that, that artist. Um, so again, we could only scratch the surface, but I hope this gives you guys a sense of sort of how in-depth the system is um, and what features are available. Uh, if you have any questions, I, I have time, but I want to be sensitive to everyone else's time. So I'm happy to field any if there are any. Um, you know what I could do too, John, is share your uh, email address yeah, that would be uh, fine. With, with the small museum group, and that way if anybody has questions, they can email you? Yep, that would work well. Okay, I'll definitely do that. Um, so thank you so much, John. This was awesome. I'm happy to. Thanks for having me. You bet, and thanks everyone for watching.